Amazon gift cards is the largest digital currency being used for remittance today. It's not Bitcoin, it's Amazon gift cards. Hello, welcome to episode 24 of The Bitcoin Game. I'm Rob Mitchell. Earlier this month, I got to speak with Andrew Lee from Purse, a company that allows people to use Bitcoin to buy stuff on Amazon and at pretty large discounts. My own first thought about Purse was that it was some strange company trying to shoehorn its way between Bitcoiners and Amazon. But after talking to Andrew, I see Purse as a company that is helping to spread the use and adoption of Bitcoin throughout the world. Hope you enjoy this interview. Hey, Rob. Hey, Andrew. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well. How about yourself? I'm great, Andrew. Well, I guess I met you at the State of Digital Money Conference where you spoke on a panel, I believe. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So I'm going to start with a really basic question. It's just Purse, not Purse.io, right? Yes. Um, so we started off as Purse.io, so people you know, can, can find it on, on the site easier. Um, we, we haven't had the fortune to buy uh, Purse.com yet, but um, it is in the works. So um, Purse is the name we're going by right now. I'm curious about your background. What were you doing before you got into Bitcoin? After college, um, I was an engineer at LG, um, the, the Korean uh, consumer electronics manufacturer. Um, my first foray into payments was through a startup that I founded with a couple of my friends in Atlanta. May I take you back to LG? Cause just because I find that really interesting, too. Can you tell me more about your job as an engineer at LG? Sure. Um, so we um, were working on various projects to uh, streamline processes for, for manufacturing. I helped um, open up a factory, um, if you will, or a manufacturing facility um, in Georgia. We helped, uh, you know, I worked with the R&D lab in Korea on new products as well um, and, and bring them to the American market. Wow. So that just sounds amazing to me that right out of college you're doing that type of work. Can you help me understand how that works a little better? Sure. So, um, you know, one of the things I had kind of, I guess, going for myself is you know, the engineering background, but uh, as well as my um, Korean descent. Um, LG is a Korean company, and uh, you know, the, I, think, I think the bilingual kind of aspect um, works a lot. Andrew, I'm going to stop you for a second. It sounds like your mic is maybe rubbing against something. I'm borrowing Mad Bitcoin's uh, uh, microphone. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Are you in his studio? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, we hired him about a month and a half ago. So um, we, we use one of our conference rooms. Um, he uses one of his conference rooms most of the time to uh, shoot his videos and, and curate World Crypto Network. And you hired him to do what? Um, marketing. Marketing and community management. Very cool. So back to LG, you were... I think what, uh, how I got the job really was because I was bilingual and had that engineering background. I was there for three years and it was a, it was a great experience. I learned a ton um, about uh, managing companies, you know, doing international commerce, um, product development, as well as um, managing employees. So that just sounds like amazing experience to get at such a young age. What what happened after that? You know, I was working maybe sixty to eighty hours on, on a given week. Um, after three years, uh, you know, I was getting a little burned out, um, and I, I was really interested in um, web development as well as um, payments. I mean, one of my good friends was working um, as a banker um, in, in merchant services um, in Atlanta. And he was you know, describing what he was doing at his company, um, which was basically uh, you know, signing up um, online merchants with credit card processing. Um, this is an area that fascinated me greatly. Um, and so he left and we founded a company together. Um, and this was while I was still at LG. Um, I quit you know, maybe about a month after we started and to devote my time full time to the new payments project. And this was 2009, not in 2010, um, pre-Bitcoin. We were really fascinated about how difficult it was for uh, merchants to get credit card processing. Um, most people think that you know you just hook up Stripe or which didn't exist back then or, or PayPal, um, and you're ready to go. And, and the barriers there were just exorbitant um, on on these merchants. So we underwrote their contracts, we we assessed their risk, um, looked at their chargeback history, you know, credit reports, um, made sure they were registered with the IRS, uh, and so on and so forth. 
forth. And it was a terribly manual process. And most of the time, what we found was that we couldn't process a lot of merchants, a lot of very legitimate businesses, um, because the chargeback risk was way too high. Um, and to no fault of the business, but because the payment rails weren't built for it, I was exposed to, at that time, you know, much of the inefficiencies of credit cards. You said like you were particularly intrigued in payments. What had you so interested in that area? So, um, you know, one, one of the things that, you know, I started noticing and it's played out, um, you know, over this decade is that more and more successful, profitable businesses are shifting online, reaching a global market or at least not a regional market. It was a huge opportunity for um, all kinds of businesses to start transacting online. I really saw payment um, in, in addition to um, web development as the main barriers for democratized commerce, if you will. Um, and so, so at the time, we were really working on you know, both um, integrating payment solutions into websites, as well as uh, dealing with the uh, what I call now legacy banking infrastructure to get the proper permissions um, to start business online. Interesting. Well, I certainly could guess where this is going to end up. Right, right. So for um, two years, we, we were running this um, startup in Atlanta. It's called Superior Payment Solutions. Um, it was mostly a B2B product. And we connected with web developers all around the U.S. to help uh, their clients accept payments. Um, and we came up with a really innovative way to incentivize the web developers as well as the um, as a client to provide the best processing possible to these various merchants. And so, you know, after about a year or two, you know, I started noticing a couple things. Um, Stripe was taking off um, around that same time. Admittedly, um, I, I found their solution probably to be more a, li a little more elegant. Um, and so business was growing. Um, there was a British company, um, and they made an offer um, at, around that time to uh, purchase, purchase our portfolio. Um, and you know, our, some of our largest uh, clients included like lids.com, um, the, the hat shop. We sold off our portfolio, and you know, I was really exploring what to do next. After we sold our portfolio, you know, I had a lot of time on my hands. And it was just kind of reaching out and, and trying to figure out you know, where I could position myself to get exposure to the latest innovations um, in payments. Um, so I took a job with Merrill Lynch, um, and I covered emerging payments um, for, for the company. Um, and we, we launched dozens of proof of concepts um, back then with everything, including you know, Apple Pay to Paydian to all these payment solutions that um, were at the time being promised as the, the most cutting edge um, form of transferring value online. And you know, after a while, you know, I started noticing the same things. Um, the, the core inefficiency was having to deal with the, uh, with the traditional banking system. So um, I, I think most people, when they take an Uber ride or check out on Amazon, they don't really understand how complex a credit card transaction is and how much permission is required to get the payments all the way through. The common denominator of all these exciting and innovative approaches to payments, they were still all relying on this ancient infrastructure between the card networks and you know, ACH transactions between banks. And so around that time, you know, I kind of stumbled upon Bitcoin, and it was a completely novel approach. Um, it cut out most of the inefficiencies in, in, in the system and replaced it with a you know, trusted network type system. Um, I'm going to avoid the term trustless here, but um, when I stumbled upon Bitcoin, I realized that this was the um, first truly innovative approach that I had seen um, to bringing commerce online. When is this? Um, 2011, 12, I guess, is okay. somewhere around that timeline now. I had a Diwala account because Diwala was one of those companies that were on my uh, on my radar, mm -hmm. and I saw you know, and so I followed the steps, bought some Bitcoin off Mt. Gox through Diwala, um, which is actually a really incredibly easy process um, at that time until they shut it off and started kind of playing around with it, you know, trying to understand the, uh, uh, the infrastructure behind it and realized, hey, you know, this is going to change the world. So I, I quit Bank of America and sometime before that uh, met my co-founder Kent and we, we started Purse with the mission of, hey, you know, the Bitcoin, we all know, uh, you know we all agree that Bitcoin is really revolutionary technology, but how are we going to get this into the masses? Why are mainstream users going to actually use this stuff? What, what does that adoption path look like if Bitcoin were to succeed? 
So we, you know, we came up with a uh, with a solution um, to build a marketplace on top of Amazon um, because there, you know we knew from the get go that we couldn't match Amazon's inventory or logistics or you know a, a, you know any of these things. So so we decided to build right on top of them. And the cool part, you know, the innovative approach, I think compared to all the other companies that were trying to do something with Amazon and Bitcoin, was that we created a market. We let um, people with Bitcoin set the discount that they want through reverse auction. And we allowed the market to determine what the discount should be. Um, and over time, uh, we noticed that you know, this was much higher than we expected. 20% is much higher of a discount than we originally expected. So you know, we kind of dug into that, tried to make this product easier to use, and, and so on and so forth. And, and today, we have the largest user base of Bitcoin shoppers in the world. And this year alone, we transacted over $2 million dollars of which you know, a quarter of it just came from last month. And it's turned out to be you know, a, quite a successful product within the Bitcoin space. Can you describe just a little bit about uh, the different functions you and your partners, Kent? Yes. We both share an engineering background. Kent is more technical than I. So, he, so um, Kent is the CTO of, of our company and manages you know, most of the engineering efforts. I basically I do everything else. <laughs> How much help have you guys had with coding and that type of stuff? So the very first thing we did um, was go through an incubator. And we went through Plug and Play's inaugural Bitcoin class a little over a year ago. We worked with um, a lot of the Bitcoin companies there, and we had a lot of coaching that Plug and Play provided, um, you know, including the likes of you know, Andreas Antonopoulos and uh, you know, regulators and investors and so on and so forth. And um, we really started to build the team then. Today we're at six, um, with I guess three or four of us are working on the product, and we have um, two, including Mad Bitcoins, um, you know, helping with uh, operations and marketing and business support. I'd heard about things that worked with Amazon, um, you know, as I was getting into Bitcoin on Bitcoin Talk. In fact, I, I see, I guess uh, it must be Kent because I see a response from Mr. Kent with all this purse stuff on there about another. Similar um, service that I don't know if it ever got off the ground got called a GBSB, Get Bitcoin, Spend Bitcoin. But oh, so so yeah, so that was our um, first name. Oh, <laughs> that, that was, was you guys. Yeah, that was us. Um, oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> oh wow, that's so funny. Okay, I didn't follow. I didn't follow that. Uh, looking at that thread, so that is amazing. That was you and. October 2013, is that right? Yeah, so, so I, at that point, I, Kent was just kind of playing around with this idea. The original name was um, Get B, Spend B, um, and it was getbspendb.com, I believe. Um, you, you know, we decided pretty early on that was a terrible name. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so, but there are definitely remnants of it, you, you know, floating around somewhere. <laughs> well, I've got to tell you, I mean, when I first saw these people doing this, I was, I mean, I thought it was really interesting, but I sure didn't want to touch it. You know, I was like, oh, who knows, are these guys scamsters? Is it going to work? Is it, you know, there seems so many things could go wrong. So it's, it's all really amazing to me that you guys have gotten this far and are, you know, obviously doing something right. Um, so I actually used Purse for the first time and I was kind of putting it off because I thought oh, it'll be kind of a hassle it'll be some work I'd already signed up at that event and I think that was pretty simple so I was just shocked at how simple I, f I found a product that I wanted to order and I basically just enter my address and pay with Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, so we, we've abstracted a lot of the, the complexity away from the user experience. Um, so for, for users, and, and what we're really proud of is uh, through, like, especially through Instant, um, the shopping process is as easy as Amazon. Um, we've uh, even replicated you know, Amazon's trademarked one-click checkout process, uh, which is called Snap, um, where we store an address on file. And if you have funds in purse or uh, funds in your linked Coinbase account, um, then there's no QR codes, there's no copying and pasting addresses. You just click a button and you're done. Um, so, it, yeah, I think that making the process as easy to, to use as possible was a, a critical factor to our growth. Just sharing it with, uh, it was actually people in the Let's Talk Bitcoin Slack that I was going to be interviewing you and tried it and liked it so much, um, or I thought it was so simple, was the main thing. 
So one guy's comment was that, oh, I, d- I don't like the wish list thing. And I didn't see a hint of a wish list thing. So there's two modes on Purse. One's instant, where you just get 5% off and it's very easy. It's, it's, it, the shopping experience is um, like Amazon. Um, and there is the name your discount, which is a marketplace transaction um, that, that gets you higher discounts. Um, and the name your discount feature requires uh, users to build a wish list um, on Amazon. And many users do this already. I don't have the percentages in front of me, but you know, many people just find items on Amazon that they like and put it into a wish list. Well, we leverage that wish list property to do marketplace transactions. The reason why we do the name your discount or wish list in the first place is that um, the other party never has um, knowledge of the, u- the other user's uh, physical shipping address. Um, and we thought this was very important. Um, if we were going to build a marketplace um, for Bitcoin, we wanted to have better privacy than eBay. I want to stop you here and dig in because I was definitely curious about that. How do you achieve that? You can tie a shipping address um, to any wish list on Amazon. And that address is only known to um, the user and Amazon. Okay. So, okay. In, in fact, we don't even know it. So, so my realization is the privacy is only if you do the wish list, but you don't have that privacy when you do the instant buy? So if you do instant, just like Amazon, um, you, know, you, you, you have to let us know where to ship the items to. In that scenario, um, Purse knows your shipping address just like uh, an Amazon transaction. But on the marketplace one, it's more private. Well, I mean, you're still trusting one company, which is Amazon, or um, with through Instant, it's Purse. Um, but but it's you're not sharing your address to uh, other users on our marketplace. How is the information when I do an Instant Buy getting to Amazon and not being shown to the user who actually makes the... Uh purchase with Amazon. Instant is a brokerage model where we purchase gift cards from our, our trusted buyers and use those gift cards to purchase the shopper's items. So it's, it's more like, say, like Coinbase without the exchange, just their brokerage model. You tell them what they want and they buy the Bitcoins from somewhere and, and give it to you. So there is no other party on those type of transactions. It's so just- yeah, so the purse is the other party. Ah, okay. So that's why I was so confused. I didn't understand that part. That clears up everything. <laughs> okay. Um, and so you pay obviously Bitcoin to these people. Is that is there a whole other market for for you guys buying these uh, Amazon cards, gift cards? Buyers on our site have um, six different levels, um, and we, uh, from our trusted buyers that have excess Amazon gift cards, um, we make offers to them um, to buy those gift cards just to us um, with Bitcoin. Are you able to give like uh, like about what the exchange rate is for Amazon dollars, uh, like to dollars? Priced in Bitcoin or Bitcoin priced? In- yeah, it really depends. Um, we it's a market rate as well. I mean, we determine it, but um, but it depends on the buyer's level um, and how many transactions they've done with us. But on average, can you say a number, or is that kind of? Uh... It, it'll range anywhere between like ten to ten to twenty percent. I I didn't mention this to you yet, but I actually purchased a product that I sell as an Amazon seller. And so once it marks a shipped, I, I'm just really curious what I'm going to see. Um, who it? Because I can see, and this is something I don't know if people realize, but you see a lot of information if you're a seller on Amazon. So right, right. So yeah, yeah. The thing, the thing about Amazon, and they do a really great job of this, is they run a marketplace, um, but they abstract away the two party kind of system from them, so it looks like you're just buying from Amazon. And um, roughly forty percent of Amazon transactions are conducted through a marketplace. Um, and and if you're you know if you're an Amazon seller. It, that um, you're de- you definitely know all about this. Um. Yeah, so I'm just curious to kind of see the transaction from that side, from both sides. I basically bought something that I sell that's fulfilled on Amazon by Amazon. So oh, that's crazy. <laughs> I noticed some kind of a wallet associated with Purse. Can you tell me a little more about that? Sure. Every Purse account comes with a wallet um, where users can store funds for everyday purchases. It's not a wallet that we recommend for you to store your life savings, um, but on, on average, our active spenders um, store about a month worth of their Amazon's purchases onto Purse, so they don't have to you know, ma- manually do Bitcoin transfers for every single time they purchase an item. So can you do just any Bitcoin transaction, send, send Bitcoin anywhere, or is it only in, in your system when it's in the wallet? No, it's a, it's a, it's a Bitcoin wallet. It's, you can send Bitcoins anywhere through our system. 
And can you describe more like, uh, is it a web wallet or is it code loaded? So it's a, an app basically in the, your browser or how does that work? Yeah, so today it's a web wallet. Um, it's a hosted wallet. I mean, very similar to you know Coinbase or um, or any any other web wallet that you use like that. Um, in, in the next week, we're uh, switching to multisig, um, where um, we won't have control of users' funds. This is actually the first time I'm announcing it in public. Oh wow! But, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so uh, we have that in the works. Um, it, it should it will be available uh, next week. So the announcement is a multi sig wallet, basically. Yes. And do you have any good stuff that like you know how about how your data is secured? I mean, currently our, our we we have best practices in um, security uh, in Bitcoin. We do frequent penetration testing, or actually always being penetration t- tested by w- w- white hat hackers, um, and. Uh, we have security audits. Um, we, in terms of our cold storage solution, um, I'm hesitant to describe it fully, but you know it requires multiple people to go to different safety deposit boxes and so on and so forth to ensure that coins aren't lost. How has regulation shaped this project? One of the driving forces for us to switch to a non-custodial multi-sig solution um, is is around you know, regulatory risk. But um, more important than that for for us is security for users' funds um, and and really doing what Bitcoin was designed to do in the first place. Um, it, you know, early on, kind of when when we were smaller, we we're still trying to figure the things out. You know, how these transactions and escrows would work and things like that. And it was just easier for us to go with this hosted solution at that point. But, you know, I mean, at this point, you know, we have the development resources. There's been better tools coming out to market that make these types of things easier. And there's no, there's really no reason for us to not move to a, a multi-sig wallet for users. That's what we're, we're focused on today. Um, from a regulatory perspective, um, we, we think of ourselves as uh, very similar to a gift card exchange. Our marketplace consists of people who sell um, Amazon gift cards and uh, and people who shop with Bitcoin. So just like Cardpool or Raise or any of these other um, gift card exchanges out there before Bitcoin that exchange PayPal dollars for gift cards, we fall under that same um, umbrella, at least from a federal guidance level through FinCEN. Um, FinCEN has this um, you know, long exception clause for their money service businesses for what they call prepaid access. Um, which is what gift cards and things like that fall under. Versions of regulatory uh, statements like BitLicense, for example, um, that you specifically call out custodial funds and the need for surety bonds for, for those types of things. And I think our new model for our wallets, our new wallet, wallet infrastructure, will help us uh, mitigate any risks of that sort. When I'm doing an instant buy and it's actually working with purse instead of a private person, it almost seems like you're acting in in that case as a payment processor. Or I see it more as as just, as just a merchant. You're buying something, an item from a merchant, and they ship it to you in exchange for your for your bitcoins. You know that merchant has to get the merchandise somewhere, right? Um, and we we use Amazon. That makes sense too. What do you think are some of the things that really impress you that you've pulled off? I mean, is there any technology that was really difficult or figuring out the niche or just getting people to use the system? You know, when we first started off and when I first even looked at um, Bitcoin from, you know, from 2012 or, or something when, when Mt. Gox was, was really the only Bitcoin company around, um, what we found missing in the ecosystem was practical reasons why consumers would use this stuff, would use Bitcoin, right? Um, there is a huge hurdle into learning how to use Bitcoin. Um, and you know, from everything from learning you know, private public keys, you know, uh, you know, how to store your, your private key, and, and, and all these things, it's intuitively very different from um, anything that most people have done um, in the past. So our mission was to drive useful applications that would get anybody excited about using Bitcoin. Right, um, and so and, and I, there's a lot of precedents for this. Decades ago, um, companies started publishing um, little coupons that they mailed out to households. What people would do is they would take a pair of scissors, dig through all the junk mail, find the coupon that they want, clip it out, um, t- remember to take it to the grocery store, present it at point of sale, scan it, and and, and all to save a little bit of money, right? Well, so, you know, our thesis was that if we, if we can deliver the best deals on the Internet, people would be willing to learn how to use Bitcoin. 
And 20% off Amazon, I mean, is much better than in, in a two, 50 cents off uh, you know, tooth, toothpaste um, at the grocery store. And, and buying Bitcoins off Coinbase and you know, learning how to use that and, and, and transferring it over to the purse and, and making a purchase is a lot easier than um, clipping out coupons. Um, the same extends to you know, the 21st century um, where you know, co- companies like Groupon um, develop pretty innovative ways. And if you think, of, think back to the original Groupon model, um, you bought essentially a coupon online, printed it out on a piece of paper, remembered to take it to the merchant, presented it um, as, as, as a form of payment. And, and people did this. I mean, uh, and, you know, I know most of that model's shifted to the smartphone now, and, and it's a lot easier. But people were willing to, to jump through all kinds of hoops to, uh, to learn to save money. Um, and, and so uh, Purse's value proposition um, from the get-go was, we're, well, we're going to deliver discounts at everybody's favorite retailer, right? Um, Amazon has the world's largest um, inventory. Um, and if we can figure out some way to give people discounts on that using Bitcoin, right, um, that, the, that this would be huge for the community. Um, and, and so we started off with that mission um, and, you know, we're, we're expanding to more. And I'd love to talk to you more about our plans as well. But, um, but, but what was really critical and what really stood out um, was that and it was confirmation that you know, people were willing to learn how to use Bitcoin and to save money. How can you tell um, that people are learning to use Bitcoin rather than are already existing Bitcoiners? So I think the first um, six months of our business, the product was probably a little hard to use. We saw, you know, like people that were really committed to trying to learn how to use this thing. Um, we're, we're probably all the only users, users we had. They were they were hardcore Bitcoiners, right? But when we when we started introducing things like, you know, Coinbase API or, um, or or Instant, we started getting these support tickets from people that were like, well, you know, I have a little Bitcoin left over on my purse wallet. How do I move this back to Coinbase? Right? People didn't know how to do a Bitcoin transfer. Um, and, and and so that's a clear indication that they weren't existing Bitcoiners that they came they, that they came through Purse to just to learn how to do this, and um, you know another model that we see is that we see every single time we refer a Coinbase user to sign up and, and purchase Bitcoin, and lately um, we we've seen you know tons of users sign up for Coinbase for the first time and buy their first Bitcoins for the very first time just so they could save on Amazon. There has been a shift as we made the product easier um, to use. Um, that we saw more and more people that had never used Bitcoin before, didn't know how to do a Bitcoin transfer, you know, hadn't read their white paper, weren't on um, our Bitcoin, use, using our product. And that's been, that's been really um, satisfying. I was going to ask you, what do you envision kind of for the long-term future of your company? But you sounded like you had some maybe shorter-term stuff. They are kind of the same answers. So we've done three things, I think, really successfully over the past year. One is making spending Bitcoin easy. Two, delivering discounts. And three, providing liquidity, right? And that third piece, providing liquidity to you know, people who had excess Amazon gift cards and now they can get into something a lot more liquid, it was a really interesting discovery. But the, the ease of use and the escrow and customer protection and all these different things that we've done as a company um, for our Amazon application, we started to think, well, why couldn't we do this for everybody else? Um, well, you know, why, why couldn't we add um, a way for people to, you know, send, um, pay any merchant anywhere in the world um, the same way they pay on purse um, through one click without doing QR codes or without doing, you know, copying and pasting addresses and completely permissionlessly. Um, so unlike, you know, the other Bitcoin processors in, in, in this space, uh, you know, what, what we decided is we're not going to do any fiat conversions and we're not going to depend on any banking relationships. Which is uh, somewhat ironic, considering my last job was at one of the largest banks in the world. But what, what I found there is that, that that's a limitation in, in the innovations that a startup can take. Um, and so the long-term idea is to leverage, uh, especially more the more novel um, innovations in blockchain technology, to provide multi-sig escrows. Um, for any merchant that wants to partake in that. And so as a consumer, when you see this merchant accepting Bitcoin through purse, you can rest assured knowing, A, that that transaction isn't just going to be an irreversible transaction that you send to this no-name merchant. Um, B, that purse will arbitrate and provide support for that transaction if anything goes awry. And three, that merchant will, will receive Bitcoin without having to depend on any 
banking infrastructure. So this this kind of goes back to um, my first startup right? and the challenges that I've seen in, in businesses building online storefronts and uh, and really going back and providing value to them and telling them, look, you know, here's here's the alternative um, to paying you fifteen know, percent on a credit card transaction because you have some kind of minor history of chargebacks. Um, you can take this permissionless system. We'll real time settle to the merchants. Purse won't have any control of these funds and can't steal your escrow and provide permissionless banking um, for the world. And, and the really exciting part about this is um, if you think about how many transactions um, that are conducted in person or with cash and don't have online business models. So I'll give you one example. So my wife and I are in the market for, uh, for a house here uh, in the Bay Area, and uh, you know, that's a nightmare of its own. But we were looking at it, the foreclosure market and kind of looking at the process to, you know, to buy a foreclosed house, right? Because the prices here are, are, are ridiculous. What I found so surprising, right, um, in the 21st century in San Francisco, um, the process to buying a foreclosed house is on the courthouse steps, like at 8 a.m. on a predetermined date. Mm-hmm. Um, and you bring a briefcase full of cash or a cashier's check and do that transaction in person, right? And how limiting is that process, right? Why can't a Chinese investor, you know, sit, sit in, uh, in, front, uh, in Shanghai, um, bid on properties all around the world and, and with the click of a button, right? Well, if you really think about the way payments are designed, like this is this is like a really impossible scenario. Like uh, uh, bidding for, uh, for, you know, half a million dollar house um, on an online platform is impossible with wires and credit cards today. Um, even if you're using wire transfers, you know, and, and the starting bid of a house was say half a million dollars. Well, so the first bid comes in, they wire you half a million dollars, or else you don't know if that guy has a half a million dollars or not. The next bid comes in at five fifty, you take another wire, six hundred, you take another wire, and and so on and so forth. And by the time the auction ends, you have like twenty x the amount of funds that you you need. Then it's a matter of reversing all these auctions, right? It, it's just, it's a it's a really like crazy model to try to build online, and that model does not is, exist online because the uh, payment rails today are limiting. Um, blockchain uh, or Bitcoin blockchain or any blockchain technology really uh, offers a very elegant solution to problems like this where each bid can be placed in a smart contract if you will and each subsequent higher bid will uh, create a refund to, to the lower bidding user and you know, we can create some kind of interface that says you know, the new bid is 650 um, you do want to bid 700 or 675 or, or what have you and build this all programmatically into the pro- protocol and uh, you know, these are the types of services that we're really excited about and looking forward to building the features. Wow. So this is really the first, uh, just a small step with those kind of goals. Does purse make money in the short term or is it really just looking for the long term? So we make revenue. I don't want to disclose the percentage that we take. We take, there was actually a Reddit article about our fee structure, but no, I mean, we, we, um, we generate um, enough um, revenue to cover at least two or three Bay Area salary people. You are six though, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so we are six. It's amazing to me the, um, what I thought of a, a business like this um, back in 2013 when I was reading about it and to see what you've been able to do and, and then how lofty your goals are. It's pretty exciting. At the conference, you answered a question explaining who were the people who had all these Amazon cards. And I thought that was really fascinating. Do you want to kind of go over that? Sure. People probably don't know this, but Amazon gift cards is the largest digital currency being used for remittance today. Uh, It's not Bitcoin. It's Amazon gift cards. Um, and, and, And this is pretty fascinating. So there are dozens of platforms like Mechanical Turk in which people uh, earn a living um, by doing some kind of task uh, that, that they decide to do. And so the challenge here from a payments perspective, say you're Amazon and you're running a mechanical Turk and 80% of your user base lives in India, Philippines, or Indonesia. Well, how are you going to pay those people, right? You can't integrate to all those banks over there. Um, how, how are you going to get pay them any, any value for their work? Well, so what Amazon did, and this is decades ago, um, is to start issuing Amazon gift card credit to their balance. So if you're a mechanical Turk in India and you, know, you, you completed you know, a bunch of tasks and you earned $50, rather than giving you 50 US dollars, which they can't do, um, they'll send you $50 and am- immediately transfer $50 in Amazon gift card to your balance. There's $15 billion worth of Amazon gift cards floating around in the world today. Um, you know, a good big chunk of that is international um, and representing maybe two or three times the market cap of Bitcoin. 
Further, there's dozens of startups that use these same exact rails to do things like that. So there's a Mechanical Turk version for smartphones called uh, like Juno Wallet or um, Swagbucks, um, where people in India or, or what have you, or, or even people in the U.S. that have free time, can just take these tasks or fill out surveys or something from their smartphone. Because these are, one, microtransactions, and two, international, these companies can't come up with solutions that, um, that integrate with all these different banks. And the second question, even if you could, right, even if you could integrate with all these different banks, what you'll realize is, you know, in those countries that the majority of the population is unbanked, and it, that wouldn't do them any good. So what these people have been doing, people like mechanical turkers or people that are earning a, a, a living off of Amazon gift cards, their path to liquidity is ridiculously difficult. So what they'll do is ac- accumulate, like, say, $500 worth of Amazon gift cards, buy an iPad from Amazon.com US, um, pay $70 in shipping, wait two and a half months for the iPad to clear customs, pray that you know, the Indian Postal Service won't steal their iPad, and once they get that iPad, two and a half months later, They'll sell it for, to their friends for rupees. That's the path to liquidity for the largest digital currency um, in the world today. And Amazon gift cards, unlike every other gift card, um, can't be transferred through a gift card exchange. There are like technical differences, um, mainly due to the fact that you can't check the balance of an Amazon gift card, that make it impossible for third-party exchanges to transact Amazon gift cards. If they don't know what the value of the card is and they can't just sell it to somebody no, or pay you for it, for, for that matter, we solve this kind of like low-hanging fruits uh, problem um, in, in the world of digital currency remittance today. The reason the discount on purse is so high is 20%, the average discount on purse is 20%, is because it's that difficult for, for Amazon gift card holders to get to liquidity. We provide probably a bigger benefit to these people than people who are saving 20% on Amazon. It sounds like a lot of people who are doing this are probably in lower income countries than the U.S. Is that right? Yes, it, it is. Um, we serve a global population. A big chunk of our buyers are um, in those three countries that I listed, um, in India, Philippines, and Indonesia. Any rough percentages? or? Yeah, so um, our spenders um, on the shopper side, it's roughly like 80% U.S. Um, and maybe like 5 to 10% Japanese and the rest European. On the Bitcoin earner side, we, have, we probably have less than 20% um, in the U.S., um, with, the eight, with 80% being international. So it's basically flipped around. And why do you think uh, Japan seems a little higher than I would have expected, at least 20%? We didn't really um, understand why that happened. They are early technology adopters, um, and they're fascinated by um, Bitcoin. And it's also a country that has a huge credit market. So like loyalty programs, um, gift cards, and things like that um, are, are something that Japanese, the Japanese you know, users are very familiar with. They, they understand you know, that like a $100 gift card from some, some merchant is worth less than $100 cash in your pocket or $100 with a Bitcoin in your account. I'm sure a part of it happens to be the fact that Roger Ver, one of our investors and, and customers, lives in Japan. And it probably doesn't hurt that like we were on some blog that went viral in Japan that we tried to translate um, <laughs> to understand what's going on. But um, it's a very engaged and active community in Japan. And so a couple months ago, we translated our entire support site into Japanese. Um, we, we did our, our video in, in Japanese to try to really localize there and, and make sure, you know, they all understood how this worked. And, um, yeah, we even have Japanese support. We have an intern that provides uh, support for our Japanese users that may not be comfortable writing to us in English. I hadn't really thought about you're attracting people to Bitcoin on both sides. I just thought about, oh, buyers want a deal. But people with all these Amazon dollars are probably finding Bitcoin as it's a way they can get out of their Amazon dollars. And a funny story here. There's a transaction that uh, you know, ended up in dispute. And when I looked you know, deeper, it was between um, Roger and an um, Indian mechanical Turk. Because Roger was using a like, third-party shipper, he, you know, he was taking a couple, like maybe a day or two longer to confirm than the mechanical Turk would have liked. And, and in that conversation, there's a message thread between you know, users. And you had this um, mechanical Turk 
that was trying to educate Roger about how Bitcoin works. <laughs> and Roger's profile picture and his username was just Roger Ver. Uh-huh. Um, and, and this guy had no idea who he was. Um, in the end of that conversation, I guess he was starting to get like a little bit frustrated. Was he was calling Roger Ver a noob in Bitcoin. And he was telling them, you know, this is how Bitcoin works. This is how escrows work, blah, blah, blah. I think Roger probably chuckled at that as well. Um, to his credit, he was super professional uh, <laughs> and, and, and re- released his Bitcoin. But um, it was really interesting to see um, you know, the kind of behavior, you know, because uh, mechanical gift card holders um, really just see Bitcoin on, on our platform as a path to liquidity. They don't think of it as anything else. And I think that's really awesome um, because you know, Bitcoin's finding its uses as a remittance tool, really, um, through our platform, which is something that I would have never imagined in the start of this project. Do you think the money goes back into physical currency? or? You know, my suspicion here um, in India is that they're going to exchange. Um, we did a partnership with um, Unocoin, which is one, one of the largest exchanges in India, um, to kind of help smooth that path for them. But I mean, if I had to guess, Indonesia is, is another country where we have a lot of users and um, their currency has been depreciating by like 20, 30 percent year over year. Hmm. Um, and what, what, you know, what these users will probably find is that, hey, you know, if I had kept Bitcoin instead of uh, converting to Rupia after I got it on purse, well, like I would have more money next month, right? And that they'll eventually start, you know, trusting Bitcoin more than their local currency. And another point is that we do have um, buyers in Argentina and Venezuela who I assume are buying Bitcoin through our site for the same exact reason. You know, you know, as a global trend, you know, as, as our users get you know, more educated on each side and it's already in their hands, I think that, you know, over time that people will start you know, holding these Bitcoins instead or holding as an investment or, or as savings or, or what have you um, instead of switching to local currency. Wow. Well, I had never thought about your company as doing so much to bring people to Bitcoin. That's pretty neat. Cool. I appreciate that. Well, thanks so much for coming on. Yeah. And thanks so much for um, doing the interview. Um, I think progress on this permissionless kind of commerce platform idea is going to be huge. Today's magic word is noob. N O O B. Use the magic word and claim your share of this week's listener reward of LTB coin on Let's Talk Bitcoin.com. You have one week from this episode's release to claim the magic word. To everyone who participates in the Let's Talk Bitcoin Listener Rewards program, congratulations for being one of the first to be hands-on with blockchain-based media. Can I ask you a couple more questions? Sure. I noticed like, I searched for Bitcoin under Amazon and I got six answers. Why those six with the instant buy? That's dependent on whatever Amazon is returning to us. Okay. So it's pure Amazon's choice of their top six. Yeah. yeah. The featured products, we curate that. But um, when you search, it should be identical to what you see when you search on Amazon. Can you see that your featured products get a a bump? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, We do measure that and we do. Um, try to update that and curate that as much as possible. Um, the Ledger Wallet, I mean, it's, it's up at the top right now. I noticed it. Um, it's, it's because it, it, you know it's a product that we we love and use and all the times, and it's available on Amazon. Do you ever allow people to pay for a sponsor top spot? We haven't yet, but mm, we should look into that. That'd be interesting to experiment with my product and see. Yeah. Let's make a deal right now in this recording. People can hear how it goes. <laughs> no, I'd be really curious to try. I mean, even just for like a day. My little product is Bitcoin keychains. I don't know if I gave you one when I saw it. Did you get a Bitcoin keychain from me? Yeah, I actually have it um, on my keychain. I was wondering where I got it. If you'd ever want to just try an experiment with trying to feature my Bitcoin keychain, which is fulfilled by Amazon, I'd be really curious just to, to try it if you ever want to. Yeah, yeah, we, we'd be happy to feature it. That'd be cool. But it's fun. We're, I'm still recording everything, so do you mind if I air this? Yeah, yeah. I have no idea. I'll probably edit it out. Thanks so much for listening to episode 24 of The Bitcoin Game. You'd make me a happy podcaster if you'd follow me on Twitter at the BTC Game. You can find a listing of all the Bitcoin Game episodes at thebitcoingame.com. See you next time.